revelation of the 70 weeks. Daniel chapter 9. As we move forward into chapter 9 this week, Daniel is going to help us, enable us to better understand the value and the importance of the Word of God and intercessory prayer. Intercessory prayer is where you really get serious with God, where you begin to intercede with, to God for things that are on your heart, our homes, our families, our schools, our government, our world. A lot of needs. Folks, we need to be interceding on an individual basis as well as a corporate basis for the needs of our world today. I'm telling you, our nation is in trouble. And the only hope for our nation, for our world, is Jesus Christ. And we know that one day that will all come to pass in great glory and honor. But the humanistic philosophies of our age are bringing destruction on every institute that God has ordained. There is little hope for a godly society to continue into the next generation if the church of the Lord Jesus Christ fails to live up to her obligations and her responsibilities before God. Unless the church gets its act together and repents and turns from its desire for a watered down, make me feel good kind of gospel that's being proclaimed by some, and I'm sorry for this, God forsaken, big smile on his face, false prophet, spouting hypocrisy, our nation is doomed. <clears throat> Unless we in the pulpit determine that we are going to do just as Shane Eidelman said on the video this morning and begin to speak the truth, there is no hope. Yeah. Daniel proclaimed the truth of the word to the people, whether it made them feel good or not. He was not motivated by whether the people liked him or not. He was motivated by his duty to declare God's truths. He prayed diligently for his people. He interceded on behalf of his people that God would forgive their ongoing wickedness and rebellion. Church America needs you and I doing the same thing. If we can only learn to put aside all of our worldly desires and our worldly ways, we can then get serious with God as we see in Daniel's life. And we can touch the heart of God with our needs. We say a little two-minute prayer if we can even stretch it out that long and call it good. I have to ask you, what kind of relationship can you develop in two minutes a day? Now I lay me down to sleep. God, thank you for the food. Amen. You know, and we call that good. And yet we are supposed to be in a personal relationship with God the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. And yet we never talk to Him. We never converse with Him. We never feel Him talking back to us. And we think it's all right. Why are we in the condition we're in today? Because of that. The Word of God lays dormant on the shelf. And nowadays it stays dormant on the shelf. We used to have to bring it to church before we had overheads so we could follow along if we could just find where that book is he's talking about. Now we can just leave it laying on the shelf. We don't even have to bring it anymore because he's got it up there for us. Don't we have to try to thumb through and find out where that is. Chapter 9 opens with these words, and I want to read. In the first year of Darius, who was the son of Ahasuerus, was a Mede by birth, and was ruler over the kingdom of the Chaldeans. Now I want to stop right there. That's verse 1. That gives us an introduction to the time frame that we're talking about here. 
Back in chapter 8, for those of you that have been with us, King Belshazzar of Babylon was on the throne. In moving into chapter 9, we find that the setting changed. The Babylonians, or the Chaldean Empire, had been overthrown by the Medo-Persian Empire. Darius the Mede comes into control. We had first encountered him back in chapter 5, where the text shared the, the killing of Belshazzar and his taking over of the kingdom. In chapter 6 now, concerning Daniel and his lion's den ordeal, hey, there's something y'all can relate to. Yeah, I know that story. Darius the Mede was sitting on the throne when Daniel was thrown into the lion's den. Now we find ourselves taken back to his first year on the throne. Remember, the book of Daniel is divided in half. The first six chapters uh, are kind of a historic, uh, history, if you will, historical value. The, the chapters 7 through 12 are more of Daniel's visions and the prophecies. So I take you back to the history so you can tie, kind of fit in where this vision is coming in that Daniel is relating to. So Darius is on the fir his first year on the throne, as it's spoken of here. He's the ruler now of all of the world, including the Chaldean Babylonian Empire. It is into this setting that we see our scripture unfold. And as the scripture begins to unfold before us, the first discovery we make concerns the value of God's word. How much value do you place on God's word? Do you understand this book to be the very book of life, the words of life? Or is it to you simply a book that I just can't understand? Uh, you know, I just can't get it. I, I read it and read it and I just can't understand it. Well, praise God, there's some easy additions out there if you can't understand it. Maybe you need to get something that you can understand. God's Word is not to be hidden from our understanding. God's Word is for us to understand so we can live by it. Amen. You're not going to get a complete understanding of God's Word in 30 or 40 minutes that I preach here on Sunday morning. You need to get into this word day after day after day. Even if you just go back all this next week and read Daniel 9 every day over and over. Whatever you do, you need to get the words of life into your heart. Amen. David said, so that I might not sin against God. Yeah. Verse 2, we go to it. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood from the books according to the word of the Lord to Jeremiah the prophet that the number of years for the desolation of Jerusalem would be 70. Now, Daniel, as we already know, was an extremely intelligent and wise man. He continued throughout his life to be concerned for his people, the Israelites, for their future within the plan of God. He was always thinking about what is God's next step? What is God's plan for us? Where is God going to take us to? And to find the answers, Daniel went to the book. At that time he had scrolls. And he went to the book of Jeremiah, which had been written just previous to the Babylonian invasion. In Jeremiah 29, we've got a verse here that we often use, encapsulated in these verses out of Jeremiah 29. I want to read verses 10 through 14 to you. These are, this is what Daniel read. It says, for this is what the Lord says, when 70 years for Babylon are complete, I will attend to you and will confirm my promise concerning you to restore you to this place. For I know the plans I have for you. How many of you have heard that verse? We like that verse. God knows the plans he has for me. Okay, now he's talking to a nation that's in exile. But we like to use that verse. And I believe that God knows the plans he has for every one of us. He goes on to say, this is the Lord's declaration. Plans for your well-being, not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. And I believe that is for us today. God desires to give us a future and a hope. Our future and our hope are built around the Lord Jesus Christ. 
When we are living our lives for the Lord Jesus Christ, we have a future and a hope. Let's go on. He says, you will call to me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you search for me with what? All your heart. All your wants and all your desires with all your heart. Everything that you are, that you are, your entire being. He says, you'll seek me and you'll find me when you search for me with all your heart. I will be found by you. This is the Lord's declaration. And I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and places to where I have banished you. This is the Lord's declaration. I will restore you to the place from which I deported you. Jerusalem. The land of Judah, God's promised land to them. Let me tell you what I see in this. I need to move on because we've got to get into this vision. Daniel understood the value of God's word to his daily life. He read it regularly for guidance, for direction, and for an understanding of all of God's plan. You know, I hear people saying all the time, I wish I could figure out what God's will and plan is for me. Well, how much do you read the Word of God? Well, you know, I can't quite understand what that's telling me. Well, you need to get one that you can read and understand so you can figure out what God's plan is for you and what God's will is for you. Amen. Amen. Thank you. From his study of the Word, Daniel knew the time of their return to the homeland was close. What did God say? He said 70 years. God was very straightforward in Jeremiah's prophecy, 70 years you're going to be banished. Why? For disobedience. You have not followed my rules and regulations. Oh, but God is love. He would never, never, ever try to, to cause harm to come to me, to, to banish me, to do these various things. And yet we see it time and time and time again with the Israelites. Every time they disobeyed God, sooner or later His judgment fell. If America continues to disobey God, I'm going to tell you something. We are a very blessed nation by God, but I'm here to tell you God can only put up with so much. He will only stand for so much disobedience and His judgment falls. Amen. Now I'm going to tell you, in my studies of prophecy, I've never found the United States mentioned in the prophetic word. And people often ask me, where is the U.S. in all of this? I really don't know. I think that we are a part of, if you will, what we are right now, probably a part of that European Union that pulls together, uh, you know, but I, I don't know. If God should judge America prior to the rapture of the church, there may not be an America. You know, we may belong to some foreign land by then. Who's to know? But I'm here to tell you, God's word is very clear to us of exactly what's taking place. And we see that in Syria today. Daniel remained faithful to God and to his word when most others had departed from its truth. The society he was forced to live in was very corrupt, it was miserable, and it was centered around immorality and the worship of false gods. Daniel's trust in the word helped him to maintain his strength and his faith in the midst of all of this. In the midst of the humanistic society that we are living in today, I'm telling you the only truth you're going to find is the truth of God's Word. Because everything else is gray today. You know, what's okay for you is okay for you, and what's okay for me is okay for me. And that's the way the world looks at it today. Just don't offend what I believe in. I won't bother you on what you believe in. You don't bother me. And that's why they don't want us proclaiming the truth from the, from the pulpit. Because I tell you, the truth breaks lies. Let's keep going. We've got to learn to live in the Word, to trust the Word. Our world will drive us into the ground if we allow it to. But when we remain faithful to God's Word, we will find the help to weather the storms and to come out victorious, just as we see in Daniel's life. Now, as we continue to follow the scripture, a second discovery we make concerns the value of intercessory prayer. Knowing that this 70 years that Jeremiah had prophesied was nearly exhausted, 
Daniel had counted it all out on his fingers from the time of the exile until now, and he realized he was about 69 to 70 years. He knew the time was just about up. Daniel's concern, though, centered upon the lack of repentance that he was actually seeing in the Israelite people. They had kind of become just like the society they were in. God had sent them there to judge them, and they had just become as immoral as the people who were supposed to judge them. And Daniel became very concerned about this. Was that the trumpet? Okay. I was ready to take off. <laughs> Hallelujah! Yeah, amen! <laughs> Recognizing that prayer, confession, repentance, and transformation were the only possible means of living in a right relationship with God and to fulfill His plan, Daniel determined in his heart to become an intercessor for the people of Israel. He understood they were not ready to be released. It's like somebody who spent 10 years in prison and they're going to release them out on the street and they're as bad if not worse than when they went in. They've not learned a thing and that's what's happening today in our prison system. We're turning them loose and they're worse off than they were going in. They hadn't learned a thing. That's what's happened here with the nation of Israel. They hadn't learned a thing. In fact, they've become more pagan than they were going in. Church, we've got to recognize the desperate state of affairs in the church house of today. And we need to begin to intercede on behalf of the church. Because as I keep saying, the only hope for America in these very, very perilous times is the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. For it to rise up and to declare righteousness and to declare holiness within the doors of the church itself. Then, and only then, we will be the much needed light that the lost sinful world out there needs us. That we've been sent to reach. Daniel began by repenting. And I'm going to go through this prayer fairly rapidly because it is long and I want to, I want to get it all in here I want to read it all but he begins by repenting of the wickedness of his people and consider uh, confessing their ongoing sinful ways beginning in verse 3 this is what Daniel says so I turned my attention to the Lord God to seek him by prayer and petitions with fasting sackcloth and ashes fasting for us means that we missed half of a meal we left the bread out He says, I prayed to the Lord by God and I confessed, Oh Lord, the great and awe-inspiring God who keeps His gracious covenant with those who love Him and keep His commandments. What did He say? We have sinned. We have done wrong. We have acted wickedly. We have rebelled and we have turned away from Your commandments and ordinances. We have not listened to Your servants, the prophets, who spoke in Your name to our kings and leaders and fathers and all the people of the land. Daniel humbled himself and indicated his reverence for Almighty God. He got serious with God because he recognized the seriousness of the sinfulness of the nation of Israel. Folks, we need to recognize the seriousness of our sin. To us, it's just a little no-no we did. Oh, it's okay. You know, God understands. God understands, all right. That's why Jesus hung on the cross. Because God understands how serious sin really is. We play around with it day after day. Like it's a volleyball or something. His prayer continued by acknowledging God's divine providence to act in righteousness. Notice beginning in verse 7. He said, Lord, righteousness belongs to you. But this day public shame belongs to us. The men of Judah, the residents of Jerusalem, and all Israel, those who are near and those who are far in the countries where you have dispersed them because of the disloyalty they have shown toward you. Lord, public shame belongs to us, our kings, our leaders, and our fathers, because we have sinned against you. 
Compassion and forgiveness belong to the Lord our God. Though we have rebelled against Him and have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God by following His instructions that He set before us through His servants, the prophets. All Israel has broken your law and turned away, refusing to obey you. The promised curse written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, has been poured out upon us because we have sinned against him. He has carried out his words that he spoke against us and against our rulers by bringing on us so great a disaster that nothing like what has been done to Jerusalem has ever been done under all of heaven. You know, folks, I can't imagine how bad this, this act of judgment was because he said never before has anything been done like this. What had to be done. Just as it is written in the law of Moses, all this disaster has come upon us. Yet, we have not appeased the Lord our God by turning from our injustice and paying attention to your truth. So the Lord kept the disaster in mind and he brought it on us. For the Lord our God is righteous in all he has done. But we have not obeyed him. Now, Lord our God, who brought your people out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand and made your name renowned as it is this day, we have sinned. We have acted wickedly. How often do you say that in your prayers? Oh, God, our nation is so filthy and sinful and wicked. Oh, God, forgive us. How often do you intercede for your nation, for your church, for your friends, your neighbors, your relatives? <coughs> Lord, in keeping with all your righteous acts, may your anger and wrath turn away from your city, Jerusalem, your holy mountain. For because of our sins and the injustices of our fathers, Jerusalem and your people have become an object of ridicule to all those around us. You see what Daniel's saying? God, we are forsaking your name. We are making your name an object of ridicule to all the pagans around us. What does the world say today? Why would I want to worship your God? You go over there and waste time on Sunday going through all your ritual and stuff, and you come out on Monday morning and you act just like me, and you want me to waste my Sunday sitting over there with you? What's happening here? It's not only your reputation, it's the reputation of the God you claim to serve that's being destroyed. When you live like the pagans of this world. God help us. And as he closed his prayer, he petitioned the Lord to once again forgive the people of Israel for the sake of the name of the Lord. He says, therefore, our God, hear the prayer and the petitions of your servant. Show your favor to your desolate sanctuary for the Lord's sake. Listen, my God, and hear. Open your eyes and see our desolations in the city called by your name. For we are not presenting our petitions before, your, before you based on our righteous acts, but based on your abundant compassion. Isn't it good to know we serve a compassionate and merciful God? He says, Lord, hear. Lord, forgive. Lord, listen and act. My God, for your own sake, do not delay because your city and your people are, are called by your name. Listen to me, Daniel certainly didn't make excuses for himself or for his people. We like to make excuses rather than going ahead and confessing up to the truth before God. He acknowledged their wrongdoing, but knowing God's graciousness and His love for His people, he refused to regard their cause as hopeless. And he earnestly pleaded for mercy on the ground of God's righteousness. In so many respects, we find ourselves to be similar to the Israelites. We give little regard to our Heavenly Father except if we need something from Him. He becomes our genie in the bottle. We fail to acknowledge His laws and His commandments by the very way we live our lives. Were it not for His mercy, folks, we would be doomed. You know, I read something interesting today and I really hadn't thought of it before. It said Jesus was supplying the air for the soldiers to breathe as they drove the nails into his hands. The Bible tells us he's the sustainer of all things. Something to think about. 
Okay, let's go into the into the vision here very quickly. It's it's rather short. As we continue to follow the scripture, our final discovery is the 70 weeks. <clears throat> Daniel's seriousness about his need to live righteously and, and his intercession for the nation of Israel moved the, God, the heart of God to speak to him concerning his plan for his people in the time yet to come. And the scripture tells us this, verse 20 through 23, While I was speaking, praying, confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel, and presenting my petition before Yahweh my God concerning the holy mountain of my God, while I was praying, Gabriel, now we've heard that name, the angel Gabriel, the man I had seen in my first vision came to me in my extreme weariness about the time of the evening offering, evening sacrifice. He gave me this uh, explanation. He said, Daniel, I've come down to give you understanding. At the beginning of your petitions, an answer went out. And I have come to give it, for you are treasured by God. So consider the message and understand the vision. As Daniel was interceding and praying for the people, the angel Gabriel is once again dispatched immediately with the answer. His duty was to provide Daniel with an understanding of what was yet to come. God has given us the Holy Spirit today to help us to understand the Word of God. We need to learn to pray, Holy Spirit, help me to understand. Help me to understand what you're trying to tell me. I want to remind you very quickly as we move into this, remind you that the church age, the age we are living in right now, the age that was instituted on the day of Pentecost with the birth of the church up until the rapture is the time frame we're talking about here as the church age. This was an unknown at the time of Daniel. It had not yet been revealed. Thus, an unseen gap exists in the confines of this vision because it takes place at one point and then jumps to the very end of times as we see these visions doing. And we have to keep in mind that the church age was unknown. This is a gap that God has created in order for the Gentile people to discover the truth of the word. And praise God for that. Otherwise, we'd all be without hope. 24 it says, 70 weeks are decreed about your people and your holy city to bring the rebellion to an end. This is what's going to happen. It helps us to understand. To bring the rebellion to an end, to put a stop to sin, to wipe away injustice, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy place. None of those things have occurred yet. The 70 weeks. Let me explain what the 70 weeks is. The 70 weeks represent 70 periods of seven years each. You know that seven is God's number. It's the number of perfection. The, the Israelites, the Jews understand this. So what we're looking at here is a total of 490 years. 70 times 7, 490 years. And he says it's decreed about your people. It indicates here that God had this in mind way back in time. It's already been decreed from the heavenlies for the time yet to come. The finality of the 70 weeks will bring an end to these things I have told you because what will happen at the end of the 70 weeks is the Lord Jesus Christ will come back. He will come back and He will slay His enemies and He will set up His throne in Jerusalem to serve for 1,000 years or the Millennial Kingdom. None of that's happened. Why? Because it doesn't take place till the end of the Tribulation period. It's what brings the seven, the last seven, to an end. All right, let me keep going here, and I hope you understand. I, I've tried to make it as clear as possible. He says, no one understand this. From the issuing of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince is going to be seven weeks and 62 weeks. It will be rebuilt with a plaza and a moat, but in difficult times. After those 62 weeks, the Messiah will be cut off. He'll be what? crucified and we'll have nothing 
The people of the coming prince will destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end will come with a flood, and until the end there will be war. Desolations are decreed. Now let me quickly tell you, the time frame spoken of would begin when King Artaxerxes issued the decree spoken of in Nehemiah 2, which enabled the people to leave the Medo-Persian Empire and to return to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. That would end the Babylonian as well as the Medo-Persian exile, if you will. This was determined to be seven weeks plus 62 weeks, which equals 69 weeks, or a total of 483 years out of the total of 490. So you've still got seven years unaccounted for. So when Jesus Christ was cut off, that was the end of 69 weeks when he was crucified. And that was 483 years, which is the time frame from the time that Artaxerxes gave the decree until Jesus was cut off. It was 483 years. The beginning thought here, though, of the Antichrist begins to surface, where he talks about the coming prince. The implication is the satanic involvement that comes in and Satan's involvement in this world down through the ages until the end of the tribulation period. Going into verse 27, he says he will make a firm covenant. Okay, now who are we talking about now? We have moved to the Antichrist. All right, he's talked about these things that are going to happen. He has talked about uh, the people of the coming prince will destroy the city and the sanctuary. The Romans destroyed Jerusalem in 70 AD. They destroyed the temple and it has never been rebuilt since 70 AD. That has already taken place. But then he jumps and he says the end will come with a flood. And until the end there's going to be war, there's going to be desolations. And we can go back and Jesus talks about this in Matthew. He will make a firm covenant. Now we're back in verse 27. He's going to make a firm covenant with many for one week. Seven years. But in the middle of the week, three and a half years, he will put a stop to the sacrifice and the offering and the decree abomin and the abomination of desolation will be on a wing of the temple until the decreed destruction is poured out on the desolator. Who's the desolator? The Antichrist who is in, endued by Satan himself. Now we are projected in time, and I've put you up a little graph there to kind of give you an understanding. We've gone past the church age now, and we have entered the tribulation period where we find the Antichrist himself coupled together with Satan of the previous verse. They come together. The beginning of the tribulation period restarts the clock as the 70th week or the final seven of the original 70. At the midpoint, or three and one half years, Satan's ultimate fury strikes as he takes complete control of the Antichrist body and he sets himself up for totally destroying, totally annihilating the nation of Israel. Understand that God's plan in and through all of this is to open the eyes of the Israelites. The tribulation period, the number one purpose for the tribulation period is to wake God's people up. Most of Israel today are atheists or agnostics at least. Very, very, very few believe in, in God the Father. They just have, have turned completely away from God just as they would have throughout the Old Testament. They are atheistic in their beliefs today, very military and uh, very much into making money and all these worldly things. But What's going to happen in this seven years is one of two things. Number one, many, many, many of them are going to be killed. But the main purpose is to wake them up because they remain God's chosen people. He set out a plan for them when he called Abraham out of the Ur of the Chaldees way, way, way millennia back. And this is the fulfillment of God's plan. He's got to wake these people up. And it takes seven years of devastation.
nation upon them by all the militaries of the world with the last three and a half years being the ultimate, if you will. The abomination of desolation, we talked about this with Antiochus Epiphanes. It refers to the desecration of the temple and the Antichrist is going to do the very same thing that Antiochus did under the influence of Satan back in 170 BC where he went into the temple, he desecrated the altar by sacrificing a pig on it and he set himself up through Zeus, the god Zeus at that time, but he will declare himself, the Antichrist, to be worshipped by all nations, by all people, to be the God of the world. And those who don't are going to be killed. Many, many, many people will be saved, born again, come to know Jesus Christ during the tribulation period. And the Bible says in Revelation that all of these will be martyred for their faith. Let me continue. Just a few things left here because I'm coming to the close. The final destruction of Satan, who is referred to as the desolator, has already been decreed by God. And Satan knows it. Satan understands. He understands the word. He understands, and that's why he has tried through the ages to change God's plan, to interrupt God's plan, to hinder God's plan, to try to get Jesus to sin. To try to get Jesus to refuse to go to the cross. To try to get anything that would confuse God's perfect plan is what Satan's been doing for eons of time, if you will. As I close, I want you to keep in mind that as Daniel read the word, he understood the time had nearly come for the release of the Jews from their time of captivity. But like I said, he was heartbroken by the fact that the nation was spiritually unprepared for what lay directly ahead of them. And he fell to his knees and he prayed and he interceded. As we consider the truth of the word and the state of the affairs in our world today, let me tell you folks, unless you're really blind and you can't hear and you can't see and you can't, you know, you have no senses whatsoever, you must acknowledge that something is happening in the world today. And what it is, is it's the fulfillment of God's plan for the ages rapidly coming to a close. Yet we find the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, sadly, in this state of affairs, becoming more and more like the Laodicea and lukewarm church. Rather than becoming spiritually prepared for the bridegroom, having the oil in the lamp, we find the church today caught up in the same thing that the world's caught up in. Jesus is coming back. The trumpet's going to sound. The dead in Christ shall rise first, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up. And I'm afraid there's a lot of people that are unprepared today that haven't gotten the, the oil in their lamp, living their life for themselves, and they think, I'm okay, I walked the aisle one time, I said a little prayer. Nothing really happened, and that's the problem. Because let me tell you something, folks, when you encounter the Lord Jesus Christ, something happens in your life. Amen. You can no longer live like the world. Oh, certainly there will be times when you'll fall back, but God always by His Holy Spirit convicts you to try to draw you back as He so often did with the Israelites. Folks, we need a revival in the church in America today. I see there are pockets of revival springing up in various places around our nation today. We need a revival that sweeps our whole land. We need a revival that starts down at the very tip of Texas and begins to sweep through like a wildfire. Folks, we are in need of revival and we are a people that can do it. Amen. If we do what? The psalmist wrote these words, God created me a pure heart and renew a steadfast spirit in me. Don't cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me, but restore to me the joy of your salvation. Grant me a willing spirit to sustain me, and then I will teach transgressors your way so that sinners will turn back to you. He says it's time for a change, church. It's time for us to wake up. It's time for us to get busy. The world
world is depending upon us. Whether they like it or not, whether they'll acknowledge it or not, the world is depending upon us today because we bear the truth. We are the bearers of the light shining in the darkness. But are we living that way? Stand with me.